So, Alex, thank you for taking the time to chat. I appreciate it. Thank you for talking to me. Um, so I want to start, Alex, when people think of Palantir, um, even probably you're in Silicon Valley, they have this idea of a very um, secretive startup that works hand-in-hand -hand with the CIA, the FBI, um, helping to track down terrorists and criminals. But when you explain what Palantir does, how do you walk people through it? Well, it, it's different in, in different parts of the business. We're, we're now a very global company in the national security arena. We're probably the, the best known, most successful product. So people know us and they know we're used for targeting for, and for data protection. And so people know our work in the, con in the context of the special forces. So finding bad people, integrating the data, allowing special operators to use the data in the field on their laptops to continue their mission. Um, they know our work in the kind of national security context as finding networks that are hidden. They know our work in the illicit traffic networks, finding human traffickers, so the more, more what uh, the police and uh, internal security would do. And actually, outside of America, we're very, very well known for complying to civil liberties norms and data protection norms. So interesting, the interesting thing about it is we are somewhat of a uh, company that's shy. We, I tend to think we're more shy, shy than secretive. We don't, we're not consumer internet. Uh, we stick very closely to our own business. Uh, but because of our, the breadth and depth of our, of our work, we're, we're in over 40 countries. On, on the clandestine side, it's much more like people know the results and then they want to know why. And so what we sometimes have to explain is this is actually built on a data integration motor that is very specialized for very certain things. So in the national security context, we work hand in hand with most of the special operators in the Western world. We work in hand in hand with um, most of the class clandestine services, both external and internal in the Western world, especially in what's known as the Five Eyes, so the English speaking countries that won World War II and in Northern Europe, um, but also in many other countries. Uh, we're very well known for police work and we're very well known for data protection. What, what, what we explain is why does it actually work? And this has to do with um, our, our efforts. So we spent three years building an engine that will allow you to take any data in any source and integrate it in a way that's usable while applying rules to the data so that the secret service person, the person in intelligence, person in special operators sees all the data they're allowed to see, none of the data that they're not allowed to see, which is very important because these things tend to be collaborative. So if you go into the field as a special operator, you're probably working also with special operators from Norway, from other NATO countries from Britain, where you share a lot but not everything. And then when you go to the final mile and you're there, you need to know the data you're integrating actually works. And that engine, the engine that powers that, that's what we provide. On the commercial side, um, we spent years and years trying to develop a commercial product and uh, successfully built one recently, um, which uh, largely allows people to integrate industrial data. It's very specialized for industrial use cases. Um, also allows you to do data protection, but it's it, the power of it comes from the ability to scale across an enterprise uh, and make workers more valuable. Um, and so let me let me ask you, I'll stop there. When we talk about um, the commercial side, a corporate client, give me Chrysler, for example. I know is a client. Give me an example of how Chrysler is using uh, Palantir's technology right now. So you have a problem when you're building any kind of motor or and doing any kind of drilling. So we're well known in the industrial drilling context, in the flight context, in the automotive context although we're, we don't talk about that much publicly, but um, you have essentially a massive amount of data, but it's very hard to figure out or predict which part is likely to break under which conditions in a motor. And knowing that is a difference between making a lot of money or much more money than your competitors or much less money than your competitors because you know the parts have different costs. So one part of a typical case in, in a plane or in a car would be one part costs two cents, one cart costs a thousand dollars. If you replace, if you can predict that produce, pr replacing the part that costs two cents every two months instead of five months saves you the thousand dollars, you have a massive market advantage and a safety advantage. Um, but these things actually have to be done on the line as well. So you need a product that interfaces with everyone in the company, the CEO, the, the managers, but also the auto workers that, that has an engine that can power that and then a front end that they can work with intuitively. And the thing that's very special here that, that actually I'm, we're very much driving is I believe Silicon Valley is creating innovation without jobs and it's really hurting our, our world. And what, what's very special about Foundry is that it creates innovation with jobs. 
So the factory worker, there's 1,500 people at Chrysler using our product. 1,500 people who are technical, but they're not PhDs in, 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 in computer science or math. At Airbus, we have 5,000 workers using our product. Now, maybe I'm just going back to my old philosophical days, but what's made this company special is not that we're secretive. It's not that we're an enterprise software. It's that we've been very focused on fighting terrorism with data protection. And what we're recently now very focused on as well is innovation with jobs. Now, why should we care? Well, because if you don't have jobs, you're not going to have democracy. And I think, you know, I mean, obviously, we were born in Silicon Valley, and we're of Silicon Valley in some ways. But, but this, this, this movement towards innovation with no jobs is, is, is really hurting our society. Um, and it's, it's bad for companies. It's bad for our country. Uh, it's, it's bad for our partners. And um, what's made our product successful is when we find a convergence between philosophical, moral, and technical things and we bring it together. And that's actually been the secret of PG, or our government product. It wasn't about making money. It, sure, we're a business. We like making money. It was about how can we make sure the special operator comes home or comes home with legs. And that really is motivating. And so, the, like, on the commercial side, really finding something where workers can use the product. And once the worker starts using the product, they're, like, really valuable. Because uh, the, the worker on the front line can begin to do something that heretofore that no worker could do. Actually, a computer alone can't do it because the computer, it's weight, it's a factorial problem. It's, computers are, no, are not capable of actually doing this yet. Maybe they will be in 10 years. But by then, the worker will be so good that maybe they don't get, they, they're irreplaceable. So your point, um, Alex, is that Silicon Valley tech companies should be doing more to promote job creation and Palantir software is helping that effort? Well, I mean, you're being diplomatic. I think they should do more to stop destroying jobs. And we're doing, we're doing innovation with jobs. So if it was just neutral, like, you know, the ca cost of a house here is $4 million, $3 million. The cost of a house in Detroit is 40000 It's like, why is that? Because Silicon Valley is eating up, the West Coast of America is eating up every job on the planet. And that's a problem for our society. Now, maybe other companies don't want to be involved in that. That's their choice. Just like many companies don't want to be involved in stopping terrorists. That's their choice. Uh, or protecting data. That's their choice. Our choice as a company is that we want to be involved in this and we are driving really, really hard on this. And by the way, to your, to your viewers, what's been very interesting is a famous saying in the Valley, ask for money, get advice, ask for advice, get money. You know, the more we focused on these deep philosophical issues, the more we've crushed it as a business. And so, and so the, the idea is that Palantir software is creating jobs at a Chrysler plant. That's it, well, it's preserving jobs because once the, once the 1,500 employees are using the software, they're actually doing things that otherwise you'd need a PhD to do. And so you're making them as valuable as the PhD in software. And it scales across the enterprise. So they're more valuable than a single PhD in software because what they figure out then scales across the owner. Once they figure out, okay, well, this part and this part interact in a weird way. If we change that, then everyone in the whole, and in fact, you see this at Airbus as well, where you have these 5,000 people and a myriad of airlines hitting this data sack, which allows them to lower costs and quite frankly, obviously more important to most of us, increase safety. And do you think, Alex, as CEO of a company, is your responsibility then to also directly hire more people at Palantir? Well, you know, we do that, but our primary responsibility is to let people keep the jobs that they already have. You know, again, like we're not, I'm not saying that Palantir can like hire, change everyone who's not a software engineer to a software engineer. What I am saying is if you have a part of the company eating up the whole economy of every other part of the world, including America, including industrial things, and other, how do you, how do, how, what, it, what is the promise to the person on the factory line? Like why should they believe in, in what they're doing? And that can be changed, and we are changing it. Now, I also realize most Silicon Valley companies don't care, and nor, nor, nor do they have a, a, a corporate responsibility to care. But the funny, th the interesting thing about Palantir is we only win big where we start from a moral thing. That's what actually motivates us, and that's what allows us to go deep enough on the tech thing to be disruptive. And let me ask you this, I to turn back to your business. There's been a lot of reports, I want to get your take on this, about customer churn at Palantir, right? So there's reports of Coca-Cola, American Express, you know, it's, Home it's Depot, very interesting. that they ended yeah, those yeah. contracts on pricing concerns. Now, you know what? what's very interesting about our company is that once we moved, every, we moved everything on the Foundry platform and focused on industrials, and the central thing is we have to focus on moral things that we care about. And so when you look at our business, you know, the part of our business where we did this uh, has grown 100% year on year for like three or four years. So 
And, and part of getting these things right in the beginning when you're building a product, just like in the U.S. government, took us years and years and years of experimenting with massive data sets. Quite frankly, I'm quite grateful to all the companies we got to experiment with. That's how we built Foundry. Mm. And now we have this massive product. It's quite interesting and it's quite important. And, um, you know, the churn numbers on our government uh, product are de minimis, meaning if you take out the ones where it was like some reason we wanted to leave from always, almost non-existent. But it happens in any big business. We're a large business. So and some of that might be our fault. But what's interesting about the Foundry product is we're, we're starting to see that same kind of thing, very sticky and very focused on industrial things and very focused on job creation. And, the jo and then the, the workers and the corporate people become our allies. So that, that this is like a, a really good phase for us. Um, let me ask you, there's a, there's a lot of companies, as you know, that are focused on big data, analytics, software, products and services. You know the names. It's Microsoft, IBM, Oracle, SAP. What, what do you think in that market? What's Palantir's competitive advantage? Well, we're very focused on our own business, and I, we take that really seriously. We're primarily a creative organization, so that means we create. We, don't, we, don't, we try not to look at what the other people are doing, or, or obviously not overly. But the central difference is we go much deeper into the integration because of for moral reasons. Like we are trying to do tech that saves lives and protects lives. So find terrorists, protect our civil liberties. We're trying to do tech and are doing tech that, that does innovation and does jobs. It's a completely different mandate than the companies you've listed, which are great companies. Uh, and then on the data integration side, quite frankly, I think you know, people are very different. They're doing analytics, which is different than integration. We provide essentially the analytics stack for free. Um, you know, we're very well known for our products being very robust. Most software comes in two flavors. It either doesn't work or it's not useful. Our, our software comes in the flavor of it's very useful, sometimes deadly. There were reports, Alex, I was reading you guys were on track to turn a profit in 2017. Did you, did you hit that target? You know, my lawyers will not let me comment on any economic thing like that, which I'd be very happy to talk about, but I'm not really allowed to. What I can tell you that might be interesting to you in this context is we are, you know, we, we, we're taking, we understand that as a creative company, we look creative to the outside world and not like what people are expecting in, in any context. We don't look like a national security company to a national security apparatus. We don't look like a classic enterprise software company to people who do that. We have no salespeople. Almost everyone here is an engineer. I'm a PhD in philosophy. Um, we are making great strides to standardize everything so that uh, if we choose to ever do a public offering, we could do it immediately. And so in, the, in that context, we're making a lot of strides. And at the time we chose to choose to show things, I think people will be pretty surprised at, at, at like the, the quality of the revenue. Do you think, um, you know, some of those early investors have been uh, patient out. Do you think, does the company now boast the kind of financials that you think would excite and attract public market investors? I think people will be, when we do this, I think people will be very surprised at, at what they see. Uh, and I think they will be positively surprised because what, be, because we've been quote unquote secretive, people always assume that we're different than what they expect. Maybe sometimes positive, maybe sometimes negative. What what they will be surprised at is how a creative company can create margins that are very uh, significantly better than what people normal, normally say. I want to touch on valuation quickly. Actually, you know, a couple of years ago, you guys were valued at around twenty billion dollars. Um, some of your investors, including BlackRock, though, have been marking the value Palantir down, not up. What, what's your take on that, and what do you tell those investors to get them just more excited about the future of the business? Um, talk to the clients. Look what we're doing. Look at our track record for delivering. You know, it's interesting. We've been through, we've been at this for a while, and we've had times where people are really overly excited and underly excited. This is a time where people, you know, are, are underestimating what, what we're doing, and that, that time will be gone very quickly. And by the way, I'm very, I, it's like one of these things you're always annoyed when you're CEO and people like write an article, is, but quite frankly, we wouldn't be where we are except for these, you know, these articles because people make no effort to compete with us. You know why? Because they don't understand how well we're doing. And that's really cool. Thank you. Please thank all the people. Every time someone writes something like that, they are making us better. And not for like, because we're, you know, it's not the Nietzschean thing, anything that doesn't kill me makes sense because, you know, people really look at Palantir and they, they, have, they don't understand what we're doing and why we're doing it. And I'll tell you what we're doing. We're stopping terrorism with data protection and we're doing innovation with jobs. And you know what? You'll find that the lagging indicator value of that is much bigger than people realize. And they will find that out too. A couple of years ago, um, Alex, you know, President-elect Trump held a meeting 
uh, with top tech leaders. It was Tim Cook, Larry Page, Jeff Bezos. You were there, which surprised some people. Were you surprised that, that you got invited to that meeting? I'm surprised when anyone invites me over. I, you know, I'm, I'm just a guy. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a guy with a PhD, and most people, you know, you know, like I, when I'm invited, I show up. We're we're a company that works in the service of of more important institutions. I was happy to be invited, honored to be there, glad to show up. Has the Trump administration been good for Palantir's business? You know, we're very focused on our clients. I, it, uh, we work we work with our our agencies directly. I, I haven't seen a great impact on on our business, depending on who's president. Did you read Holman Jenkins' piece in the journal about the Park Ram shooting? I only bring it up because I talked to Lisa. It was it was just interesting about how and it brought a volunteer to me. He really thought tech was going to play a role in stopping the next mass shooter. His point being that big data could help pinpoint the next shooter. Did you have strong feelings about that, Alex? Did you agree with that? Because it made me think of obviously you guys, the tech you do. Whether you thought that thesis was valid. Um, there, there's a there's a there's a broad statement of like tech can help, which is obvious. The single biggest thing that we have to work on in this area, not just in this area, is like we need to know what we know, and that is a that is a data integration problem. Now, I'm not look. I'm a representative. I, I, I built this company. I care about the company greatly. I'm not in, but I, pri first and foremost, like all of us in America, we want this to work, whether it's with Palantir or with another company or with the U.S. government, I don't think any of us actually care. But watching these things happen is, is really hard for all of us. And the part that I do know something about is that you cannot solve this problem unless the data is integrated and integrated in a way that's lawful. And I know for a fact that there are ways to do that. And I, I hope, and like many of us, pray that we actually get that to work because it's a, it's a tragedy and, and act quite frankly disgusting that these things happen. Hey there, thanks for checking out CNBC on YouTube. Be sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all of the day's biggest stories. You can also click on any of the videos around me to watch the latest from CNBC. Thanks for watching.